Shalom and Shabbat. I just want to take you for a little road trip through the Bible and through history. Uh, I'm going to start with the Shabbat night uh, with Josephus, the new and complete works of Josephus. Okay. I'm going to turn to book 18, chapter 3 of the Jewish Antiquities. And I'm going to show you Yahweh Shai in this book. So this is chapter 3, book 18, and we're going to drop down to section 3 and 63. And Josephus is a trusted historian, and I uh, agree with most of his writings. And we're going to drop down here at 3 and 63. Of course, he was taken captive by the Romans. If he changed anything, it was to hide it from the Romans. But he didn't hide Yahweh Shai. He puts it here. He says, this is in section 363. Now there was about this time, Jesus, Yahweh Shai, a wise man. If it be lawful to call him a man. For he was a doer of wonderful works. A teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. What's the truth? Psalms 119. And verse 142, thy righteousness is everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. It's the righteousness of the Most High. It says, he drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles, which were the ten tribes and the Gentiles. He was the Christ, or Hamashiach, and when Pilate at the suggestions of the principal men among us had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day. See that? So his resurrection did happen. He appeared resurrected on the third day. As the divine prophets have foretold, these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him. And the tribe of Christians, there's no tribe of Christians, right? These are the tribe of the Israelites that were Christ-like. So named from him are not extinct at this day. Now I'm going to go into the prophecy that Yahweh I gave, which is in... The King James Bible, the Gospels of Luke, chapter 21, verse 20. So now we know that Yahweh Shai did exist. Josephus has an accurate account of Yahweh Shai living on the earth and doing miracles, something no man could do. This is verse 20. This was Yahweh Shai's message to the 12 tribes of Israel. And it says, And when ye shall see Jerusalem compass with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is near. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. This only happened one time in history, and this was in 70 AD. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So the Gentiles have overran Jerusalem since this prophecy came to pass, which was in 70 AD. And they're going to keep the land of Israel until prophecies are completely fulfilled, until this is completely fulfilled of the Gentiles. So where are the Israelites? They've been led away into all nations as what? Captives.
So let's see if this prophecy came to pass. This time we're going to go into From Babylon to Timbuktu by Rudolf R. Windsor. From Babylon to Timbuktu by Rudolf R. Windsor. We are going to go to page 84 in this book. And we're going to drop down to the second paragraph. It reads, In the year 65 B.C., the Roman armies under General Pompey captured Jerusalem. In 70 A.D., General Vespasian and his son, Titus, put an end to the Jewish state, Judean state, with great slaughter. During the period of the military, governors of Palestine, many outrageous and atrocities were committed against the residue of the people. During the, during the period from Pompeii to Julius, it has been estimated that over one million Jews fled where? Into Africa. One million fled into Africa, fleeing from Roman persecution and slavery. The slave markets were full of black Jewish slaves. And here is a precept, Deuteronomy 28, 64. And the Most High shall scatter thee among all people, from one end of the earth, even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. Deuteronomy 28, 64. So it's saying here that one million Jews fled in Africa. All right, so... Let's go into the book of Josephus and bring it out. <clears throat> Let's look at the historical note. This is the Jewish Wars in the book of Josephus. Book 5, chapter 3. I'm just going to go to the insert. Right on the side column. We can start at the top. It says, here we, here we see the true occasion of those vast numbers of Jews that were in Jerusalem during the siege by Titus and perished therein, that the siege began at the feast of the Passover, when such great multitudes of Jews and proselytes of the gate were come from all parts of Judea and from other countries in order to celebrate the great festival. Tacitus himself informs us that the number of men and women and children in Jerusalem when it was besieged by the Romans as he had been informed was 600,000. Notice these numbers and notice what we're seeing on TV today. Okay? When we see Gaza and when we see Israel. They're using the same numbers. That 600. It says this information must have been taken from the Romans. Notice what they said on the news. 1.1 million uh, people from Gaza have been given notice to leave Gaza, right? So let's keep reading this. Let's see if we see any familiarity here. For Josephus never recounts the numbers of those that were besieged. Only he lets us know that of the vulgar carried dead out of the gates and buried at the public charges was like was the like number of 600,000 chapter 8 section 7 however when Cestus Gallus came first to the siege that sum and tacticus is no way disagreeable to Josephus history though they were become much more numerous when Titus encompassed the city at the Passover as to the number that perished during the siege, Josephus assures us, as we shall see hereafter, they were, look at that number, 1.1 million. Hmm. Besides 97,000 captives. But Tacticus' history of the last part of the siege is not now extant. So I just want to show you that they didn't have their numbers quite right, but it was in the millions. 
So what we read in Babylon and Timbuktu is right, is, is approximately right, because they couldn't estimate the number of Jews that came for the feast of the Passover at that time. And you go to Deuteronomy 16 and 16, and that should explain it. Three times in a year, Jews would come to Jerusalem from all over the world to keep the Passover, keep the Feast of Tabernacles, and to keep the Pentecost. So what have we learned so far? We've learned that Yahweh Shai did exist, and he did miracles, and he did raise on the third day, and that the prophecy came to pass where Jerusalem was ransacked by Titus and Vespasian of the Roman armies, and that one million Jews fled into Africa. All right. We're going to go to one more page in Josephus to strengthen the fact that the Jews went into Africa. This is book 14, chapter 7. And we're going to go down to section 115. All right, so it says here, the highlighted part, there were four classes of men among those of Cyrene, which is in Africa, North Africa, that of citizens, that of husbandmen, the third of strangers, and the fourth of Jews. Now these Jews are already gotten into all cities, and it is hard to find a place in that habitable earth that has not admitted this tribe of men and is not possessed by them. And it has come to pass that Egypt, which is in Africa, and Cyrene, which is in Africa, as having the same governors, a great number of other nations, imitate their way of living and maintain great bodies of these Jews in a peculiar manner, and grow up to their greater prosperity with them, and make use of the same laws with that nation also. So Jews were all over. They were all over Africa. See that? All right, going back to from Babylon to Timbuktu, we're going to go to page 90. Page 90. And we're going to drop down to the middle of the first paragraph where it says, The Jews, the highlighted part. It reads, The Jews imported into the western part of Africa a superior material, educational, and moral culture soon after 300 A.D. And this cultural advancement was not duplicated or exceeded until the ascendancy of the Mohammedan leader Mensa Kakan Musa of Mali in 1312 A.D. In the 3rd and 4th centuries A.D., the Africans on the west coast did not possess the cultural superiority of the Africans on the north and east coast. So we just read in Josephus that they were in Cyrene and in Egypt. Okay? They were also in Angola and Morocco. Let's drop down. The black Jews had an advantage over the African tribes. They carried their culture, history, laws, and written records with them. This assured them a constant precedent for the development of a higher social organization. Because of the stability of the black Jewish culture, the Jews were not absorbed into the autochthonous population. In fact, the Jews absorbed some of the native tribes. The Jews made use of every opportunity. They were an industrious and skillful people. In the Jewish or Judean Ghanaian states were found kings, princes, governors, generals, secretaries, treasurers, revenue agents, judges, architects, engineers, doctors, historians, language interpreters, mathematics, jewelers, sculptors, masons, carpenters, painters of art, goldsmith, leather workers, potters, armors, saddlers, blacksmith, agriculturalists, etc. You see that? So we went into West Africa and other parts of the world. But we have recorded information here. 
Okay, we're going to go to another page in this book. Page 115, we're going to go to the expulsion of the Jews from Spain and Portugal. I want to give you a totality of all the Jews who fled in Africa from different places. Not only Jerusalem, but from Egypt and Cyrene, plus other places. Now we're going to talk about the expulsion of the Jews from Spain and Portugal. And we're going to start with the last paragraph. In order to satisfy Queen Isabella of Spain, King Manuel of Portugal promulgated a royal decree expelling the Jews and Moors from his country in 1496. This was a papal bull. The Jews who were expelled from Spain and Portugal, I bet a lot of people didn't know that there were Jews in Spain and Portugal, and they were black. Expelled from Spain and Portugal were scattered throughout the Mediterranean coast. It is estimated that over 100,000 Jews departed from Spain and Portugal during the persecution and the expulsion. Some of these Jews went to Northern Europe, Italy, and Turkey, but most of them went to Muslim countries of Northern and Western Africa. These black Jews would naturally go to African countries most of all because of less persecution and they could disguise themselves easily among blacks. See that? Drop down here. All of this is pertinent to what I'm bringing out, so pay attention. So we know that Yahweh Shai came into the earth and he made a prophecy that if we didn't keep these law, statutes, commandments and have faith and belief in the Father that he did away with sacrifices for a short pot, short period of time so we could repent and turn back to the place and go back to our place. But we didn't do that. So the curses fell upon us. Here's another example of the Spanish-Portugal explosion. During the reign of King Joel II, or John II, 700 black children were ruthlessly taken away from their parents in Portugal and transported to the island of San Tome, off the west coast of Africa. The island is located near Nigeria, Cameroon, Gabon, right? And this happened all in 1484. I just want you to get an idea of what happened in history, that we were pushed into Africa. So a lot of these people that you call Africans were actually Jews. Okay, I'm going to go to this book. It's uh, called A Tribute for the Negro. A Tribute for the Negro. <laughs> By Amistad. This was published in 1848. Let's go over to page 65. And we're going to drop down to the last paragraph and we're going to read the under, underlying sentences it reads a remarkable fact in the history of Luango in the empire of Congo is that the country according to a statement which was fully credited by Oldendorp himself a writer most correct judgment and of unpeachable veracity contained many Jews settled in it. Settled where? In, in Luongo, the Congo, who retained their religious rights and the distinct habits which keep them isolated from other nations. Though thus separate from the African population, they are black and resemble the other Negroes in every respect as to physical character. It is probably in allusion to this case that Penitent in his textbook says the descendants of the colony of the Jews originally from Judea settled on the coast of Africa are black. See that? The Jews are black. Let's drop down here. It reads 
the Portuguese who planted themselves on the coast of Africa a few centuries ago have been succeeded by descendants blacker than many Africans. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Now here's another book, it's called Tariq al Fatash, The Timbuktu Chronicles, 1493 to 1599. Now, we brought all this information out about the Jews going into West Africa. Let's prove that they did something. Let's see what they left behind to prove that they were in West Africa. We're going to go to page 119. This is proof that they were in West Africa, the Jews. This is an eyewitness. It reads, this is the second par this is the third paragraph on page 119. In the course of the year 902, September 9th, 1496, August 29th, 1497, the town of Tinderma was built. The Askia Muhammad oriented the Khan Fari to build a capital for him following the recommendations of the prince Amar searched those regions now where's Tinderma I wrote right here it's right by Mali Africa and below Timbuktu I'm going to turn the page to 120 with islands as well as those in the desert and at last found Tinderma, a site that attracted him. The place was formerly inhabited by a community of Jews, from whom the remains of tombs and wells can still be found. When those in the retinue of Omar came upon the these wells, now wells, if you had knowledge of uh, constructing wells in those days. You were like an engineer. You were a rich man. These Jews understood how to build wells. Remember, Abraham had a well. And Isaac and Jacob. All right. It says, which were then numbered at 333, both in the confines of the town and on the outskirts. And when they observed the manner in which the wells had been dug and arranged, they were extremely amazed. I'm going to drop down. This is the eyewitness. It says, here is what was reported to us by one of our contemporaries who lived in Morai Kora, the Morai al Sadiq, son of the Jurist. Mori Mama, son of the Jurist Mori Mamaka, son of the Jurist Mori Haugaru. He told us that he had once heard his father in conversation with men of his own age say that he had heard his grandfather tell the following story. It was not on the order of the she that the Jews had dug these wells nor because they were very wealthy, but because they grew vegetables that they sold to the merchants at a good profit and because the water from these wells was better for the vegetables than the water from the river. Anyone who watered his vegetables with the water of the river did not get the same results. Their vegetables were also not as pleasing to the eye as those which were irrigated with the water of the wells. This was the reason why the Jews had dug these wells. So it's telling you right here that these Jews had knowledge of constructing wells and this is what they left behind as evidence that they were there. Next page is 121. We're going to page 121, second paragraph. At this time, seven princes ruled over this town who were descendants from Judean kings, namely Jabrut, Aban, Hasham. There's Yemen, Ibn, that means son of Abdal Hakim, Zahir Ibn Saham, 
right? Each of them commanded a large army, and each prince was assigned his own will, both for himself and his army. Whoever mistakenly drew from the wells to irrigate his vegetables with water from a well belonging to another prince was required to compensate the prince who was the rightful owner of the well. Whether the mistake, whether the mistake had been made by a free man or a slave, each prince commanded 12,000 horsemen. As for his militia, that is, those who marched on foot, they were too numerous to count or tally by census. So now he's giving you understanding of how he dug the well. But the point is that Jews were in West Africa, had knowledge of construction. Just like we read in Babylon and Timbuktu. They brought their doctors, they brought their carpenters, their masons, their architects. So when America came and got these Jews and brought them to the Americas from West Africa, you don't think they knew who they were getting? Deuteronomy 28.64 And the Most High shall scatter thee among all people, from one end of the earth even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. And among these nations shall thou find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. But the Most High shall give thee there a trembling heart, and felling of eyes, and sorrow of mind. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee. And thou shalt fear day and night, and shall have none assurance of thy life. And this is our people, who are scattered to the four corners of the earth, and especially to the Americas. This is Leviticus chapter 26, verse 40. Since we know that Yahweh Shai existed, the Hamashiach, and we disrespected him, and didn't believe him, this is why we're in these lands. This is verse 40 of Leviticus 26. If they shall confess the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass, which they trespass against me, and that also they have walked contrary unto me, and that I also have walked contrary unto them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled, and they then accept the punishment of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob, and also my covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham will I remember. And I will remember the land. The land also shall be left of them, and shall enjoy her Sabbaths. See, right now, the land doesn't have the true people there. And that's why you see the things going on there today. That's all part of prophecy. While she lieth desolate with them, and they shall accept of the punishment of their iniquity, because the true people are scattered to the four corners of the earth, and they're not in the land. Because there's no peace in that land. When the true Jews go there, there will be peace there. It says, because they despise my judgments, and because their soul abhorred my statutes. And yet for all that, when they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away. Neither will I abhor them, to destroy them utterly, and to break my covenant with them. For I am the Most High thy power, the Most High still has his covenant with you, children of Israel. But I will for their sakes remember the covenant of their ancestors. You are the ancient Israelites. Okay. The children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the prophets. But I will for their sakes remember the covenant of their ancestors whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. In the sight of the heathen. That I might be their power. I am Yahweh. Now we're going to go to Daniel, chapter 7, verse 11. Daniel, chapter 7, verse 11. It reads, I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spoke, I beheld even till the beast was slain, and his body destroyed, and given, given to the burning flame. Who is this beast? This is the last beast on the earth. This is a fourth beast, which represents the Roman Empire that's been broken down into the European Union and the United States of America. 
This is the last beast that's ruling earth. This is why you know that all this stuff that we're seeing is prophecy. Verse 12. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away. Yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, who was that? Yahweh Shai, came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days. So Yahweh Shai came with the clouds, which are the angels. And it says he came to the Ancient of Days, which is the Most High. And they brought him near before him, near the Most High. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. See that? So Yahweh Shai is going to rule all nations. He's going to have the throne of thrones. Okay? But he's got to destroy this last beast that's on the earth. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. Alright, let's drop down to verse 18. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. So what's going to happen? Yahweh Shai is going to give the kingdom to the saints. He's going to give the kingdom to the saints to rule forever and ever with him. Okay, this is what's coming, and the kingdom of heaven will be on earth. So all of this is coming to pass. This is the prophecy. This is the end game right here. All right. So keep your faith, watch and pray, and stay alert and give praise to the Most High Yahweh through the testimony of Yahweh Shai by Shem Hamashek Yahweh Shai. And with that, I'm going to say Shalom.